I've got to bring Greg Combe back in because you mentioned earlier the, uh, the idea of philosophy underpinning uh, things that are going on. Now, one of the philosophies is that industries must survive on their own two feet. They must survive in a free market with free market capital. Um, what is the role of governments here, in your view? Well, uh, which is the question, uh, an entirely appropriate one. As many would know, neoclassical economic theory essentially doesn't see a role for government in uh, the business decisions that are taken. And it's not just assistance for the car industry that in which you've got to understand that policy setting, which is a direct uh, payment in various forms with various purposes, but it might be tariffs. It might be taxation policy settings. It might be accelerated depreciation arrangements. It might be research and development concessions. It might be soft loans. It might be various arrangements in venture capital. There are a myriad of ways in which governments intervene to try and meet market failures that in pure economic theory, in neoclassical economic theory, the argument is that that's wrong. And it was only seven months ago that I was Minister for Industry and Innovation in the federal government. And I can say this argument is had virtually every day in policy making, certainly in national politics, and it would be at state level as well. For me to obtain any form of assistance uh, for industry, um, I would have to formulate and take a submission, fight my way through the central agencies, and be able to sustain that argument in the cabinet to obtain support. And I can tell you it's not an easy process. It's, in fact, a rigorous one, and I'm certainly not saying it's inappropriate in any way. It's a good thing. But it brings into focus the competing economic philosophies that you're dealing with in relation to this issue. And it is important that people understand and appreciate it. No intervention by governments whatsoever. Neutrality in all the taxation policy settings. There'd be a lot of work to do to achieve all of that. Or alternatively, interventions to meet what we could describe as market failures. That's what's in play, and it's not just an issue that's settled by the way in which SPC's been dealt with by the federal government or the way in which the auto sector's been dealt with by the federal government. There are a whole host of other industries, and in this state, steel, uh, lead and zinc smelting at Nearstar, um, even the policy settings for green technologies. Uh, the gentleman spoke to me earlier about solar panel production, the renewable energy policy settings in this state divert investment and resources into uh, that sector of the economy. And I just think it's a fallacy and, and a completely um, silly proposition that governments don't have a role in this. Governments do have a role. They've got to be prudent in their policy settings, consider the economic policy implications, how it affects the allocation of financial resources, but ultimately interventions are appropriate in certain circumstances to achieve particular outcomes. And that issue is in play now in national economic policy debate, in state economic policy debate as a consequence of what's happened in just six months with the new federal government. And I'd encourage people to engage in that debate. I'm not trying to cast you in a particular direction, but understand the issues because the implications of the direction that we're now set on in federal policy settings are extremely serious. Okay, I'm gonna to go to uh, some of our uh, businessmen on the panel, David Allett, uh, reflecting on what you're just hearing here. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, you might wanna uh, answer that question that I asked Frank about future for manufacturing here, because yeah. you have a thriving manufacturing mm -hmm. business in South Australia, but also while doing that, reflect on Frank's call for capital from government, mm -hmm. that is loans from government, and also what government's role should be. That was taken by your comments earlier about how cities and states elsewhere have actually recovered from this sort of situation. I think um, we can learn from them. I mean, let's do more of what we do well. But well, we do defense pretty darn well. So we're in a position where we enjoy about 25% of defense spending. And that's really as a result of... The state, you mean? The state. Yeah, the state. Not your company. Not, unfortunately, not my company. <laughs> Um, the state, over a period of time, has been consistent in its approach. It's invested in tech port, common user facilities. And this has been consistent governments who have had the same view, the same approach. So that level of consistency in a long-term program business like defense is critical, I feel. And we've seen it here. We've got organizations such as Defense SA, 
such as the Defence Teaming Centre, DSTO, on our doorstep. So these organisations have consistently lobbied, supported, kept government aligned to supporting defence. And we enjoy those results now. 25,000 people employed in defence, either directly and indirectly. It's about a 50-50 mix in South Australia. And that can be more. So, frankly, let's do more of what we're good at, and I would argue for defence. Yeah, what? we'll come I'll back. Answer, we'll, answer we'll, we'll come back to the uh, defence. Can I answer your other question? Yes, go, please go. I ignored it. No, 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 no. <laughs> We've had support from South Australian government to help us create business cases to invest and frankly we've invested in a, a titanium machine, machining facility that is state of the art. There is nothing else like it in the southern hemisphere. Now this will really drive our competitive position to export on JSF programs, aircraft programs, but also in commercial work. Now we will, that's a kernel of a business. It's not going to deliver returns in day one. Probably not year one, year two, or even year three. We're talking about year five, year 10, year 15. That will be the kernel of a business. So we jointly funded that activity. And this is so the- you future. and the state government? Yes. Yeah. And so we've had great support from the state government. Yeah. Let, let me hear also from uh, Alf down there. I mean, I don't know if you've had support from the state government or not, or from any government, or whether you think support from state governments is necessary to we, work, to thrive in manufacturing. We've had very limited support. Uh, I'm a great believer that businesses should stand on their own two feet. Um, when you look back and you read a lot of the uh, newspapers, people talking about an exchange rate being the reason a business has gone under fundamentally tells me there's been a whole void of leadership for 10 years in the automotive sector because you can't sustain a business model on uh, an exchange rate, which you actually fundamentally don't control. So I, we don't support uh, government intervention for funding. I do believe if you look at a solution base, our top 10 businesses in this state uh, are predominantly privately owned, high entrepreneurial skills across a, a multitude of sectors, being food, packaging, uh, you know, mining. So. I truly, I truly believe manufacturing has a place. We are just not focusing in... The, the leadership void for me is at a business level and a government level such that we are always trying to find the silver bullet to actually fix this problem. We just need to do a whole risk management assessment on the industries that have been successful over a period of time and government should give us a platform to move above that and business need to take it on. So the less government involvement, uh, for me, the better it's going to be, to be honest. Okay, we've got a difference of opinion then among our uh, business people and manufacturers on the panel. Uh, Raymond, um, what do you think going forward? We've got an election coming up uh, in South Australia. Is that going to change things? Uh, well, it may. Uh, it, it, does, it does present, I guess, uh, the fact that the election is coming up when it is and all of these issues are happening now certainly influences the debate and probably uh, slows a little bit down because I think there's a hesitancy. Uh, I mean, this is a great time, frankly, to demonstrate bipartisanship. And I think there are areas in this, uh, in this discussion that it's not hard to get uh, bipartisan support around. And I frankly give both parties a great deal of credit, for example, uh, when uh, the Minister of uh, uh, Industry, for instance, travels overseas, uh, he takes his shadow member, uh, shadow minister with him, and the two of them sell South Australia. And the message is, you know, you can come to South Australia, it won't matter which of us happens to be the minister and the shadow, uh, you know, there's going to be a consistent environment to support you. I think we need more of that, uh, and it's going to be difficult, frankly, in the next, uh, whatever it is, four weeks, five weeks to, to see that. And, and I think that, frankly, does influence potentially the Commonwealth's participation in this uh, discussion also at this time. So uh, I guess I stand a little bit between both of these guys. Uh, um, I think as part of the state's response, which, uh, which I was involved in helping advise on, uh, the reason I supported the concept of a jobs accelerator fund, which uh, called for uh, government funds government money, but also to leverage private banking money, hopefully on a ratio of four to one. So uh, you know, something creating a pool of money in the 800 million to a billion dollars, clearly managed by the private sector. 
uh, I think the last thing we need is it managed any way, any way else, but the use of a revolving uh, government fund to help uh, supplement uh, uh, commercial loans and to bring things forward with a focus and covenants around jobs and jobs acceleration, I think that makes sense. But the success or failure is going to rest squarely on the shoulders of people who run these businesses. And I think there does have to be, to a degree, a bit of a mind shift. Uh, the focus of business in South Australia right now uh, is really about how we scale up. Because the quickest way to, to add new jobs beyond the normal number of jobs that get added by business as usual is by accelerating job growth in existing businesses. Now then we'll also have other opportunities like the HP announcement uh, recently that they're going to uh, move four or 500 jobs into the state. That's great, let's take that. Uh, and we're gonna get startups and there are a number of people in this room who've got some very exciting startups that will grow. But I really think in the next two to four years as we have to speed up uh, the process that we were maybe thinking was a 10 year process, uh, it's gonna depend on those in this room and others who have uh, existing businesses, and I like Frank's uh, uh, innovate, that are innovative, that are, autom uh, that are automated, and that have talent. And the investment in talent is absolutely critical. Perhaps the biggest inhibitor beyond capital to our ability to respond to this is skills and, 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 uh, and, and talent. Okay, I have